If you have your Bibles with you, we are in 1 Kings 18 and looking at verses 19 through 40 this morning. As we continue following the life of Elijah, that nobody from nowhere who was called by God and called to go on what should have been a suicide mission. Once again, the historical background. After Israel split in two, Israel and Judah following Solomon's reign, uh, the north and the south split up. The north uh, stopped going to Jerusalem to worship, so they split from the temple. They stopped having priests in the order of Levite. They made their own high places, their own places of worship, got their own priests. Uh, they stopped having kings in the line of David, as the Lord had desired them to do, and they basically left Yahweh. And things went from bad to worse, from king to king. Each one was worse than one before that, until we hit the low point with King Ahab, who married Jezebel, who was the daughter of the king and priest of Baal of Sidon. And at that point, uh, under the inspiration of Jezebel, I think Ahab was kind of a wishy-washy guy and Jezebel very aggressive. Uh, they sought to basically exterminate all of the priests of Yahweh from the northern kingdom, which is still called Israel. Can you imagine Israel has basically kicked completely out Yahweh and is now saying, we worship the Baals and the Ashtarah, which were the, the god of thunder and rain and the god of fertility, basically. Now, they were an agricultural land. You could understand why that would be attractive to them to appease the gods of thunder and rain and fertility for their crops. However, Yahweh made it very clear there are no other gods. He is the one. They had fallen back into this belief that each area had their own gods that they focused on, and they were basically kicking Yahweh out in favor of the Baals. That's how low it had fallen for the nation of Israel. And in this context, God calls Elijah and calls him to go face to face with Ahab and tell him, it will not rain again until I say it rains. And then he whisked him off to the brook of Cherith, where he fed him miraculously. Well, I shouldn't say miraculously, but it is miraculous. With ravens who brought him uh, food and, and bread and every day, and he had a brook there to drink. When that was done, he took care of him in, in a land that was a surprising place to send him, in the land of the Sidonians, which is where Jezebel came from. And there, a widow took care of him, and God took care of all of them. And he also, when that son of that widow died, Elijah, by the power of God, raised him from the dead. And now we have three years of drought. No rain for three years, all of Israel. And God calls once again to Elijah, says, now it's time for the big one. This coming up today is the thing Elijah was really called to do. This is the big show. This is what God raised him up to do in this situation where Israel was kicking out Yahweh and establishing the Baals as the God of Yahweh. Basically, all those other things we've been talking about were really preparation for Elijah for this. When he went to Ahab face to face with that bold statement and lived, God was showing him, I will protect you. You can go face to face with anybody and be bold. When those ravens were bringing him food and when that widow took him in and those, the jar of flour and oil did not go dry, did not go down, he was teaching him that God will provide. When the widow's son died and Elijah, by praying to God, raised him from the dead, God was teaching him, through me, you can do anything that I call you to do. Those were lessons, I believe, of preparation for Elijah for what was coming up now. The big show. And so if you look at uh, verses 17 through 19 of 1 Kings 18, it says this. God tells Elijah, go see Ahab. So this is the meeting. Ahab saw Elijah. Ahab said to him, this is you, you troubler of Israel. In other words, this is your fault that it hasn't rained for three years. Verse 18, Elijah answers back, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, because you have forsaken the commandments of Yahweh and you have followed the Baals. That's the issue. That's the reason for which God raised up Elijah. And so now we come to this great showdown. We start with the challenge. Verse 19, and we'll read 19 through 24. Now then, this is Elijah speaking. 
Send and gather to me all Israel at Mount Carmel, together with 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of the Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Now you say to yourself, my, Jezebel must have had a big table. But that's a figure of speech which means she was supporting them. She was paying their salaries, in effect. So Ahab sent a message among all the sons of Israel and brought the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And by the way, it appears that the 400 prophets of Asherah did not show up for this encounter. But at any rate, we go on. Verse 21. Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. And if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Now, let them give us two oxen. Let them choose one ox for themselves and cut it up and place it on wood so that with no fire under it, and I will prepare the other ox and lay it on the wood, and I will not put a fire under it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of Yahweh. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. For some reason, this kind of cracks me up. All the people said... That's a good idea. I don't know why I think that's funny, but it seems like a funny response. <laughs> At any rate, here we have the challenge. He says, here it is. And he invites odds of four, 850 to 1. Of course, the Asherah priest didn't show up for whatever reason, ended up being very smart in hindsight. But 851 odds, because Elijah knows that God has called him to do this. He has learned his lessons from the previous encounters with Ahab and from the book of Cherith and from living with the widow and through him seeing the son raised from the dead. Why didn't Ahab just kill him? You ever wonder that? Why didn't he just kill him? I mean, here's the guy that's the cause of all this. I think the answer is kind of interesting. Uh, I think if he feared Elijah, Elijah came to him and said, it's not going to rain until I say so. Three years later, it has not rained. If he kills him, he has no chance to say so. So it'll rain again. I, I think Ahab believed that. And secondly, I think he liked his odds. You know, he was convinced that Baal was, was the right God, evidently. And so he's saying, yeah, this, this sounds good. Let's do this. So then we have this challenge. And the call was to take an ox for each of them. Very, very simple. Build an altar. Cut up the ox, put it on the altar, and pray to your God. It's interesting, though, how he challenges the people. He says, how long will you waver between two gods? This is Israel. Israel's named Israel because Jacob's name was changed to Israel. It's the sons of Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the one God called forth, the one he promised the land that they're now living in. One who promised that through them all the nations of the earth will be blessed. They've been following for generations. This is Israel. They're now kicking Yahweh out and worshiping Baals and Asherah. He says, how long are you going to be, how are you going to waver? If Yahweh is God, follow him. If Baal is God, okay, follow him. And they say, yeah, this is a good idea. So here comes the showdown. One of the great stories in the Bible. One of my favorites. As we begin with verse 25. So Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one ox for yourselves and prepare it. First for you are many, and call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. So they took the ox which was given them, and they prepared it, and they called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, Oh, Baal, hear us! But there was no voice, and no one answered. And they leaped about the altar which they made. They were even doing their dances. They were doing all the Baal stuff they had in their repertoire. Calling on, oh, Baal, answer us, and doing their, whatever their magic dances were that they did. From morning until noon. I think I flipped the wrong page here. Just a second, let me get back to where I'm going. And it came about at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, call out in a loud voice. For he is a god. Either he is occupied or gone aside or on a journey or perhaps he is asleep and needs to be awakened. Now, the, the translation doesn't really get the humor here. What he's really kind of saying is, 
Where's your God? Maybe he's on the toilet. Or uh, maybe he's on vacation. Or maybe he's asleep. Wake him up. I mean, he's having some fun with these guys. Because they are dancing and calling, and the, the day is, is getting long, and nothing is happening. So that inspired them even more. Verse 28, they cried out in a loud voice, and they cut themselves according to their custom with swords and lances until blood gushed out of them. Evidently, part of this Baal worship was to cut yourselves. If you're really seeking him, you would draw blood. So they added to their praying and their dancing, crying out and cutting themselves and just kind of going nuts around this altar they had made for Baal. And when midday had passed, they raved until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. In other words, this was all day. They were doing this all day long. Everything they had in their bag of tricks to worship Baal, they were pulling out, and they were, they're on full display. 450 of them. What a spectacle. Imagine this. I mean, this was a spectacle. And there you have Elijah just mocking them. And there was no voice, and no one answered, and no one paid attention. Now, I want you to notice the difference between Elijah and these prophets of Baal. They've been going at it for a full day. They are exhausted. They are bloody. Everything else, nothing has happened. Verse 30. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Now, that's very symbolic, sort of. That's symbolic because what he was doing was repairing what had been torn down. That's the whole purpose of this. Their worship of Yahweh needed to be repaired. They virtually lost it. That's how low they were. But there's another thing to look at here, because this altar that is there was not an altar that was acceptable to God. You know, Israel made altars, but they were altars of remembrance. When they crossed the, uh, the River Jordan to go into the Promised Land, they were to make an altar there so that when everyone would see it, they'd be reminded of what God has done. There are certain instances in the past where they made an altar in remembrance of what God had done at that particular time. Those altars were really a lesson in history to remind them of who their God was and who they were. These high place altars were always rejected by Yahweh. See, the pagans did that. They would find the highest places and make an altar because you were closer to the gods then. And Israel started doing that. They started making altars, not to remember what God had done, but in the pagan way, to be almost closer to God. Let's make an altar on the highest hill, because that's a holier place. That's what this was. This was not an acceptable altar. But yet, he took those stones to rebuild it. But he only took 12 of them. Verse 31, Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, to whom the word of the Lord came saying, Israel shall be your name. So with the stones he built an altar in the name of Yahweh, and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two measures of seed. He took 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Remember, this was a split. This thing all started when Israel split from Judah. Ten of the tribes cut off from the other two and went their own way. And he's making a statement here saying, no, the people of God are one people. Yahweh is one. There are 12 stones. There are 12 tribes. If you want to call yourself Israel, you're missing a couple of tribes here. You're missing something. Actually, what they were missing was Yahweh. So he makes this, uh, this altar in the name of Yahweh. And then he builds this trench around it. And he arranges the wood and cut the ox in pieces, placed it on the wood. And then he said, fill four pitchers of water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. Now, this would take some time. Now, you ask yourself, where did the water come from? That hadn't rained for three years. Well, it is a known fact, even to this day, there is a, a, uh, a spring on Carmel that develops into a stream that empties out into the Mediterranean. Evidently, the spring was still flowing with water, but it was going to take a long time to fill up all these pitchers and four trips down the mountain and up the mountain. This was a long time to fill it up, but it was enough water to fill up the trench. We find out now why he made this trench to hold the water in so it wouldn't run off. And what he had was an altar saturated in water. Okay, just get this, sit back and take a look at this. There's 450 of them Try and call on their God. All day long they're doing this. 
there's one of him, and he says, I'll make it even more interesting. We're supposed to burn this up with fire? Saturate this thing with, until it's standing in water. Not standard procedure, but uh, he knows who his God is, and he knows what God is going to be doing here. So as we go on, verse 30, at the time of the offering, at the evening sacrifice, I want you to notice that. This is the end of the day. He's almost done. He's got one shot at this. When were the prophets of Baal trying to conjure up their fire from heaven? From morning until night. All day long they were yelling and praying and dancing and cutting and all that stuff they were doing. He waits until the very end. So he has just one shot at this. It's not going to be an all-day thing. At the time of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. He's rubbing that in again. Today let it be known that you are God in Israel, and I your servant. I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know you, O Yahweh, our God, and that you have turned their heart back again. The 450 prophets did their stuff all day long, everything they knew how to do with nothing. Elijah says, okay, saturate with water, and I got a shot at one prayer. Oh Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God of Israel, show yourself as the one true God today. Verse 38, And the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust. Did you catch that? This fire didn't just burn up the offering and the wood. This fire burned up the stones. This, my friends, was some fire. Like no fire we know. By the way, once again showing that altar was not to be kept there. That was not to be kept. This was not to be a new place, a new high place. This was just a demonstration of who God is. All the water in the trench was gone. Everything was gone. There was nothing left at all. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, Yahweh, he is God. Yahweh, he is God. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets and do not let one of them escape the prophets of Baal, and they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. Now, this doesn't mean Elijah slew every single one of them. It means he's the one that commanded it. They were now following what Elijah said to do. Many people say, wait a minute, this doesn't sound like God killing those prophets. Our God's not a God of killing. Remember, this is in response, first of all, to Jezebel killing or trying to kill all the prophets of Yahweh. They were getting what they were dishing out in a real sense. And once again, Yahweh was showing himself very intolerant of those who oppose him in a way of leading his people astray. One of the amazing stories in the Bible. And this is the thing to which Elijah was called. This was why God called him, for this very day. As I said before, all those other things, they were just preparation for him. This was the big one, the showdown in front of all the people, all the prophets of Baal, every single one of them doing everything they could with no response. And Elijah, who remember was a nobody from nowhere, stepping up and saying one prayer. And the completely saturated sacrifice was totally consumed. Not only that, the very stones of the altar consumed. What a statement that God made this day of who he is. And the people got it. They fell on their faces and said, Yahweh is God. Yahweh is God. And they had no more place for the prophets of Baal. So what are some lessons we can learn from this amazing story? Well, first of all, in times of great need, God will raise up great people. In times of great need, God will raise up great people. And when I say great people, I don't mean people great in and of themselves. God will make them great. Elijah was a nobody from nowhere. And God made him great. He prepared him for this throughout his entire life. As I mentioned before, all those things were preparation. 
coming before Ahab and speaking his mind and living, being cared for when there was no other place to get food, both at the brook through ravens and through the widow and those, those jars that did not run out, and then showing him what he can do through the power of God and even raising a son from the dead. All those were building up for this time. By the way, for you and I, sometimes when we're going through those really, really difficult, puzzling situations of life, the reality is God is preparing us for something greater that he has for us down the road. Some of the most difficult times in life are the times of the greatest preparation. I don't know about you, but how much do you learn through good times? The only thing I really grow in when things are going well is pride. It's those difficult times that you really are forced to seek the Lord. And you really open yourselves up to what he can do. And some of these strange times, sitting all alone by a brook in the middle of nowhere for a rather lengthy time, was done for a reason. Going to a widow who had nothing was there for a reason. Uh, that widow dying, widow's son dying, was for a reason. Sometimes the difficult situations we go through are God preparing us for something he has for us later. In times of great need, God will raise up great people. Second thing we see here, in times of great need, God will do great things. We need to remember, he is God. He can do anything. We get seduced by the society around us into thinking that supernatural really isn't. You know, science is what you can count on. That's what's true. The supernatural stuff really doesn't happen. Really? If supernatural doesn't happen, then God as we know him does not exist because he is supernatural. And because he does not always choose to do great and mighty miraculous things doesn't mean he cannot and will not. We get seduced by our times in our culture where we don't see a lot of blatant miracles like this. And we start thinking, oh yeah, God doesn't work that way. There are seasons to God's power. Pentecost was a time when the Holy Spirit came on the church like never before and in many ways not since. A season of intense outpouring of the Spirit. And then there are long seasons without that kind of outpouring. You, then you see them again in history. The Great Awakening in our country was another one of those. Spirit of God just being poured out. There's no other explanation for it. Pastors were preaching rather boring uh, theological sermons, and people were falling down and weeping. No theatrics, no fireworks, no sound system even. Outpouring of the Spirit of God. Missionaries on the mission field see these much more than we do. When the Word of God comes to people who have never heard it before, all of a sudden you see miracles happening. Yet we tend to fall into that idea of thinking, yeah, that God really doesn't work that way. And in the back of our minds, seduced by the naturalism of our world, thinking that stuff isn't even real. Brothers and sisters, God is God. And he can do anything. And he will, in times of great need, he will do stuff like this. He can. And he will in his perfect time. He is all-powerful. He's more powerful than any of the forces you can conceive on the face of the earth. For that reason, we shouldn't get too worried when the forces of this world seem to be going in a very bad direction. God is still God. When it gets bad enough, he will raise up his people to do what he wants done. The third thing we see here, in times of great need, we are called to prayer and faithfulness. How did Elijah, the nobody from nowhere, do all this, especially the, the big showdown? What a day. What a showdown. What a victory for Yahweh. How did Elijah do all this? It's very simple. He prayed, and he was faithful. He sought God. He did what God told him to do. At every step of his life, we see him simply being faithful, simply saying, yes, Lord, I am available, I am willing. And in response to all those 
machinations of the, uh, <laughs> the prophets of Baal, the leaping and jumping and screaming and praying and cutting and every, everything in their bag of tricks they threw at it. Elijah calls the people together and he prays. God, show yourself today. And this is what happens. In times of great need, God will raise up great people. He will do great things. And he calls us in those circumstances, very simply, seek his face and be faithful. And do his will and follow him. There was never a worse time to this point in Israel than there was now literally throwing out God and accepting the Baals as the official God of the land. God had his person. He had his plan. He took care of that situation. It's not the end of the story, by the way. A preview of coming attractions. Some of the most dangerous times in our lives are after our greatest successes. So far in this story, Elijah has done everything right. I'll give you a little clue. After this one, he reacts a little differently but you'll have to come back next week to hear that one. Unless, of course, you read ahead, which I do encourage, by the way. But this is our great God. Let us not put our God in a box or consider him uh, incapable of doing anything and everything he desires to do. He is a supernatural God, a God of all power. Let's not forget that. Let's pray.